From the heart of the jungle comes a savage cry of victory. This is Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. From the black core of dark Africa, land of enchantment, mystery, and violence, comes one of the most colorful figures of all time, transcribed from the immortal pen of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Tarzan, the bronzed white son of the jungle. And now, in the very words of Mr. Burroughs, the story of Quicksands of Wadahara. By afternoon, the SS Pride of Africa would dock at Tunis. And so far, the crossing had been without incident. But now, the portly, distinguished-looking gentleman who stood in the passageway outside of the royal suite was worried. It was almost noon, and there'd been no word from Her Highness. It wasn't like her to sleep late the very day of her arrival in Africa, and she'd been acting very strangely. He made another trip to the ship's bar, and then he returned and stood in the passageway once again. Finally, his irritation got the best of him. Your Highness... I hate to trouble you, but I've been a bit worried. Your Highness, there's something wrong? God! If something's happened to that girl, I'll never forgive myself. Oh, but this is fantastic. All her clothes are gone, too. Not a trace of her anywhere. This is terrible. I beg your pardon, sir. Oh, never mind that. Where do I find the captain? I'd be glad to take you to him, sir. I'm the purser. The purser? Oh, maybe it's you I should speak to. Uh, I want to report a passenger missing. Missing, sir? A ship will have to be searched from stem to stern. And if she isn't found aboard, you'll have to turn back. But the whole thing must be handled quietly. Absolutely no publicity. I'm afraid I don't understand. There are important reasons why the identity of this girl must not be known. If it leaks out... I'll hold you personally responsible. Uh, pardon me, sir. Well, what is it? Uh, you're the gentleman who's occupying cabin 36 and a deck, aren't you? That's right. Well, then you have nothing to worry about. I personally brought you a message from the young lady early this morning, but you weren't about. You see, she transferred to another cabin. Why the devil should she want to do that? So no one could find her, sir. You suppose someone's guessed her identity? Well, I wouldn't know anything about her identity, sir. Well, where is our new cabin? She was most emphatic that you shouldn't know, sir. That's ridiculous. Why, it's my job to keep an eye on her. I'm terribly sorry, sir. Unless you give me the location of her new cabin, you will be a whole lot sorrier. I'll see to it that you never get a berth on another ship as long as you live. It's cabin 432 and sea deck, sir. Sea deck? <laughs> I'm not shouting my name so that the whole ship can hear. Open the door. All right. Oh. Oh, I beg your pardon, madam. I, I was told that another young lady, that is... Uh, I'm terribly sorry. I, I was under the impression that... <laughs> I'm afraid I don't see the reason for the hilarity. I, I apologize, and I'm sure don't that... Uh, come in. But I told you that I... Uh, come uh, in, Pudgy. Pudgy? Oh, no, it couldn't be. But it is. Now, close the door and wipe the egg off your face. What in the world have you done to your hair? Dyed it. This is known as Moonlight Blonde. Like it, Pudgy? Looks terrible. I'll never live this down. You have nothing to live down. It's my hair, not yours. What in the world made you do it? Because I want to be free to go wherever I like in Africa. No one will ever recognize me now. Oh, nonsense, my dear. Your face is known everywhere. You're not very convincing, Pudgy. If you didn't recognize me, no one will. But I still don't understand this whole business. Your sudden desire to see Africa, your refusal to let the consulate know of your impending visit, and, and now this disguise as another means of dodging your responsibilities. I'm afraid you have this all wrong, Pudgy. I'm, I'm really just beginning to face my responsibilities for the first time. I, I begin to see how, how truly vital Africa is to us. At home, millions of hungry people crowded together, and in Africa, thousands and thousands of miles for expansion. Yes, 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 yes of course. Can't but you the... see, Pudgy, those thousands of miles of wasteland can be cultivated, and the millions of people there taught to produce the food and other things we need. Mm. I, I want to see the land, and I want to meet the people. But not as a member of the royal family. But how in the world... When we land at Tunis, I shall be Jane Higgins, 
tourist. I forbid you to carry out this ridiculous masquerade. You forbid me? I'm afraid you've forgotten your place. I... I apologize, Your Highness. And speaking of faces, yours has been in the newspapers far too much. Mm. I'm not having you spoil my plans, so you're not to speak to me on deck this afternoon, and you're to ignore me after we've landed. And you're not to trail after me when I go into the interior. But this is crazy. If anything happened to you in Africa, it could plunge the entire continent into war. Oh, you're taking this far too seriously. I, I managed to fool you just now, Pudgy. And anyone who can pull the wool over your eyes ought to have no trouble with a few wild animals and cannibals. I I'm not afraid of Africa. <laughs> We'll return to our story in just a moment. Pudgy, as her highness had called him, knew the mind of his mistress far too well to continue arguing with her. She'd go where and when she pleased, and he was not even free to follow her. But even before the ship had docked, he'd taken certain steps for her protection. The ship-to-shore telegraph carried his message. It was relayed by phone to a remote military post. Jungle drums sent the message deep into the interior, and a native runner finally brought it to its destination. Before the sun had set, Tarzan was on his way to a secret meeting place. And a few days later, having traversed an incredible distance, he arrived at his destination, a squalid cafe on a side street of a native village some distance from Tunis. Oh, that must be he. Are you, uh, Mr... We shan't use names, either of us. Sit down. Well, you look like a chap who can handle himself. You realize the importance of this job? The friend who relayed your message made it extremely clear that Miss Jane Higgins must be protected at any price. Quite. And you haven't much time to lose. She's hired a man to head the safari, and they plan to start for the Congo tomorrow. And you want me to follow them without being detected, is that it? No. You daren't be that far away from her. Try to get a job with the party. Use an assumed name, of course, but uh, stay at her side. See that nothing happens to her. The peace of Africa may depend upon it. You, Jungle Harry? That's right, matey. Jungle Harry, that's what they call me. But what's it to you? I understand you're heading a safari that's starting out tomorrow. Maybe I am and maybe I ain't. State your business. I'm looking for a job. As a matter of fact, I'm escorting a nice little lady on a bit of an expedition, I am. But she's paid me a pretty penny for the trip, and I can't hire anyone I don't know. Besides, I've got all the porters and bearers I need. Well, perhaps you could use a, a guide. I know the jungle better than any man alive. Why should I need a guide? Well, sometimes a man likes to share his responsibilities. It's always possible that one man can be injured or become sick. And uh, if that... Wait a minute, matey. Maybe you've got something there. Come to think it over careful, like it might not be a bad idea to take another guide along. To sort of share the responsibilities, you put it. What's your name? Uh, John Clayton. Clayton, eh? Sure you know the jungle? Oh, as though I were born in it, Harry. Jane Higgins stood in the marketplace waiting for Jungle Harry and the other members of the safari to arrive. The native bazaar was already like a tourist dream, but now it assumed new magnificence as an enormous caravan wended its way across the irregular cobblestones, on its way from Oran to the jungle stronghold of Sheikh Abdul Al-Akmar Badluf. Flanked by his wives and his slave girls, the Sheikh smiled at the pretty tourist who raised her camera to take a picture of his colorful procession. Just then, one of the Sheikh's servants stumbled under his heavy load. He brushed against Jane's camera, and it fell to the street. You stupid fool! A thousand apologies, my master. A thousand apologies, Saeed. That's quite all right. It wasn't an expensive camera. You shall atone for this insult to the beautiful stranger. Really, it wasn't... Come here, wretched one. Please, master, I please. I wish you wouldn't punish him. It was my fault. I, I was standing too close to your possession. I, I could easily... No, no, master, please. Stop I mean, that. No. What? See how you like being struck in the face. Oh, my dear. Oh, she's straight. Shake my look. You will oh, live to regret your impulsive action, my dear young lady. And you will live to regret yours. 
Africa shall not always be under the domination of fiends like you. You are a very attractive woman, but not attractive enough to act as you have acted, nor to speak as you have spoken. We shall meet again. I'm not looking forward to it with any pleasure. Rota free! These Arab rulers can cause a lot of trouble, Mum. Oh, hello, Harry. I, I didn't see you arrive. I arrived in time for the fireworks, I did. That was a mighty silly thing you did, Mum. I thought Miss Higgins handled the situation extremely well. Who's my handsome admirer, Harry? He's a bloke I just signed on. Claims to know a bit about the jungle, he does. Name's uh, John Clayton. Harry, I asked you to hire only people you've known. Why, me and John has been pals for... Fifteen years, right, matey? That's right. I'm happy to know you, Mr. Clayton. I'm happy to know you, Miss Higgins. Well, seeing as you're so happy with each other, I'll just run along and take care of the last bit of the business before we head for the blooming jungle. You must be sure that her disappearance is never traced to you, Harry. If we were seen together... Any suspicion cast upon you might reflect upon me. You ain't got nothing to worry about, Sheik. If anyone starts asking questions, I'll push the blame on this bloke, Clayton. But who is he? He's one of those drifters, he is. You can find blokes like him in any waterfront pub in the world. Some of them talk fancy, but they're all the same. Bums, beachcombers, wanderers. I know the type. And I know that everyone's always willing to think the worst of them. Well... Shifting the blame is your responsibility. All I care about is having the girl delivered to me. She saw fit to strike me across the face, and we must have our reckoning. You intend to kill her? Not at all. Such a spirited wench shall make a great addition to my harem. A harem in the jungle? In a jungle stronghold that is safe from attack. Oh, they've driven me from my own land, and someday perhaps they may storm my palace in the Congo. But as long as my life and yours, I shall enjoy it to the utmost. And this girl shall be a jewel to adorn my crown. You will deliver her to me at Wadahara Pass within the week. You still ain't told me what's in it for me. A hundred gold pieces if everything goes according uh, to plan. A slit throat if you fail. I won't fail, Governor. But you know something? I've got an idea that if I was to tell you who this girl really is, you might just decide to raise the ante. I have made the price, and you will not trick me into raising it. Will the girl be there or not? Oh, I'll manage it, Governor. I'll manage some way or other to meet you at Wariara Pass with Miss Jane Higgins. <laughs> In just a moment, the exciting conclusion of Quicksands of Guadalajara. Deeper and deeper into Africa's dark interior plunge the small safari, the torches of the native bearers illuminating the narrow elephant trail, the flickering rays falling on curious animals who appeared in the shadows and then darted off. And always at the head of the safari marched Jungle Harry, urging the porters to increase their pace. Tarzan, known to his traveling companions only by the name John Clayton, remained as close to the girl as he could, resolved that no harm should come to her. Oh, you could almost have reached out and petted Numa that time. Numa? That's an ape word meaning lion. You didn't seem to be frightened. I was, though. I've been terribly frightened ever since we started out. Well, then why haven't you ordered us to turn back? Because I wanted no Africa. As much of it as I can. I want to understand her problems and uh, and know her people. Harry? Yeah? Why are we leaving the trail? I'm taking the little lady to a native village I think she'd like to see. Yes, but there are many villages along the trail here. Not like this one, there ain't. What's so very special about the village, Harry? Uh, well, they make a lot of fancy silver jewellery. Things you might like to take home to the folks. I'm not out to find souvenirs, Harry. I, I think we should continue along the trail. Well, it's your money what's paying for the trip. If you say no, no it is. I just thought you might be interested in their native dances. Only place holds them of the kind. What kind? Well, in this particular village, 
I have a habit of placing little girls in hypnotic trances. Then they throw them up in the air and catches them on sharp swords. Quite a sight it is. Does that really go on here with little girls? I'll leave it to Mr. Clayton. Am I talking straight, matey? Well, I don't know of any village in this district where that barbaric custom is practiced. It happens, I tell you. Then I must see it. If I'm to understand Africa, I have to know what kind of people could do this to their own children. Well, this trip is dangerous enough without leaving the trails. It's, it's crazy to head into the unbroken jungles. The little lady said she wanted to see what I told her about. Now, just remember this, Clayton. I'm in charge of this year safari, and it's me that's giving the orders. <laughs> At least the veld is more open here, but I see no signs of a village. It's straight ahead, it is. I know this section of the jungle. Well, I've never been in this district before, but all I can see ahead are mountains. Oh, no, wait a minute. I I do see an opening up ahead and a suspension bridge. That's right, Jim. I figured we'd be coming to it soon. Isn't it amazing? The mountain and that that, that whole stretch of land below it is completely cut off from here. That's right, Mum. It's a sort of an island. And the bridge is the only way of getting across. That's quicksand under the bridge. No one could make it across down there. Well, where's the village? Just past the first hill, on the other side of the bridge. Do, do you think it's safe? Looks terribly old. Uh, M- Mr. Clayton, wh- what do you think? Well, many of the native bridges are very well built, but I'd like to try it before you attempt to cross over. Harry, suppose you wait here with Miss Higgins. I'm not letting you take a chance alone. I'm going right with you, chum. Well, all right. Do be careful. I shouldn't want anything to happen to either of you. We'll be all right. Well, it looks as though the bridge has been repaired very recently. It does seem to be in good shape, doesn't it, Mr. Clayton? Mm, suspiciously so. It's an old native bridge, all right, and it's been kept in excellent repair, but natives seldom repair old bridges. They, they build new ones. Is that so, matey? But there's something strange about this, Harry. Look at these tracks. Heavy wagons have been over this bridge, and recently... Oh, I can't see nothing. Oh, crouch down, and here, the way I'm crouching... You... Ah! Ah! Did you lose your balance, Jim? Harry! Get me out of this quicksand! I don't know why you pushed me or what your game is, but... And you won't find out. You'll sink into that muck inch by inch. And by nightfall, there won't be nothing left for you but a dark spot in that blooming swamp. I'll tell them that us that you led her eyes into a trap and then died in that quicksand as you well deserved. <laughs> Do not adorn my court in that soil safari dress. Why have you not changed it to the harem garb as I commanded? I have no intention of putting on that ridiculous costume. I shall forgive you the slap upon my face, but you will comply with my request. The ridiculous costume is the dress of my women, and you are to be one of them. Not in a thousand years. My skin crawls when I look at you and remember what you did to Mr. Clayton and, uh, and the native porters and bearers. Ah, the life of the white jungle rat was unimportant. And it would not have been safe to permit the natives to return home with wagging tongues. But you will forget the unpleasantness and remember only the splendor of my palace and the rich gifts I will lavish upon you. I'm not impressed with your garish palace or your gifts. And I command you to release me at once. You command me? Ah, the words of the scoundrel now make sense. Take it away. Lock her in the east tower and bring that sniveling worm to me. It shall be as you order, master. Was it me you wanted to see, governor? At least you know your description, worm. I did everything like you said, no more and no less. I have just ascertained the meaning of your veiled remarks. The regal bearing of the woman you have brought to me identifies her despite the color of her tresses. You've got a pig, matey. And as long as you've got her here, they can't touch her. You can rule here for a hundred years, and not one of their soldiers will come near the place. For fear you'll do her in. You stupid fool! They will send an army big enough to level this place in thirty seconds, and no threats I make will keep them from my throat. Even now, they may be marching about my stronghold. Now take it easy, Governor. I thought I was doing you a good turn. The person aboard the ocean liner found out who she was, 
and when he let it slip to me quite by accident, I figured... You have done your last figuring. At dawn, you and her royal highness will be killed, and all traces of your presence erased. If soldiers come, there will be no signs of your very short visit. Try to hold on another moment, Lady. Where, where are you? I, I can't see you. The night is dark. I am hanging on a slender rope directly over your head. I can see little of you. In this quicksand up to my shoulders, you can never pull me out. No, I am fragile. But if you could free one arm, perhaps you could reach this rope. I, I don't think I can. My strength's almost gone. I'll try, though. Oh, no, it's no use. You must try again, Effendi. At dawn, they killed the young woman. What? Yes, the same woman who defended me against the sheik in the marketplace. Only you can save her. Moving one arm a little. Sheik will kill me as he killed the others of your party. But I must repay her act of kindness. Uh, My arm's loose. My uh, near exhaustion. Grasp the rope. Uh, uh, Now, perhaps I can help you a little. You will find her in the uppermost room of the East Tower. I have left the door unlocked. I may not even reach the top of the bridge. But if I do, I'll try to save her. Wait for us on the other side of the bridge. We may never reach there. You but... will reach there, Effendi. Allah shall give you strength. But Tarzan's body was almost spent as he climbed hand over hand to the suspension bridge and then made his way up the hill to the flamboyant palace of the Sheik. The East Tower was a symbol that beckoned, and he scaled walls and eluded guards to reach it. And then, as he guided the brave young woman along the imposing corridors of the palace, the alarm sounded. Now Tarzan lifted the girl to his shoulder and ran. Guards swarmed from every doorway, but with his one free hand, Tarzan fought them off, and after panic moments, reached the jungle that surrounded the Sheik's stronghold. With his strength waning rapidly, he dragged the girl after him as he ran down the hill toward the suspension bridge. It was the path to freedom. Behind them thundered the angry sheik and an army of his outraged followers. Can we make it? Here's the bridge. There's nothing to stop them from following us to the other side. I, I'm sorry I, I got you into all of this. I got myself into it. I, I like danger. I don't. I've been more about myself on this trip than I have about Africa. Look. There on the ground, the axes and machetes of our bearers. Yes, they, they, they dropped them there when the sheik's men arrived. I'll take this one. You can help, too. If we can cut the bridge before they arrive, we'll be safe. Almost cut it through a few more strokes and it. Look, look it's Harry. He, he's trying to escape from the two. He's, he's trying to cross the bridge. Yeah. Oh! In that quicksand. I hate to see anyone suffer, even him, but he may be able to bridge that swamp, and I can't risk that. I've got to get you back to civilization and safety. Here we are. Yes, that's right. Here we are. (laughs) Isn't it strange? Two people face death a a dozen times together, go through the most emotional experience of their lives, and all they can say is, well, here we are. Well, some things are better left unsaid. There's a very worried gentleman waiting for you at the top of that gangplank. (laughs) Pudgy, I'll be with you in a minute. Well, this is goodbye, then. Is there anything I can do for you when I get home? No, Pudgy's soldiers have already taken care of the one request I might have made. And you know? Oh, yes. Tunis is full of the news of the sheik's capture. And I happen to recognize Pudgy from his pictures. But we're to say goodbye without even admitting that we know each other's real identity. Well, the things left unsaid are sometimes the most treasured. I'll treasure your unspoken words as long as I live, Mr. Clayton. And I, yours, Miss Higgins. In just a moment, a preview of our next story of Tarzan. Long has the legend existed, never proved true, never entirely disproved. 
And from time to time, men spend fortunes, a great deal of time, and sometimes lives, looking for the basis of this legend. The fabled graveyard where elephants go to die, and where a fortune in ivory lies on the ground, waiting to be picked up, waiting to make a man rich beyond a sultan's dream. All characters and incidents contained in our story of quicksands of Guadalajara were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual people, either living or dead, was purely coincidental. Included in our cast were Jack Moyles, Virginia Eiler, Raymond Lawrence, and Donald Morrison. Tarzan, the transcribed creation of the famous Edgar Rice Burroughs, is produced by Walter White, Jr., prepared for radio by Bud Lesser, with original music by Albert Glasser. This is a Commodore production. Listen to our next story, The Trail of Death, another thrilling episode of The Lord of the Jungle. Charles Arlington speaking. <laughs> 